the question about patience. Uh, most of the hadith encourage us to be patient with respect to the coming of the imam. We must be patient with this. Um, and what they mean is that uh, a time will come where we might think that he's not coming, where we might start thinking because of our, our uh, ag aggressive impatience, we might think that it's all a myth, it's all a fairy tale. There's no help to come from God with us. And at this point, we suffer, we die, and we die spiritually. So Imam uh, Jafar as Salik alayhi salam is reported to have said that those who have no patience with this, they will be uh, in hellfire. Okay, so we have to be patient and waiting for the Imam. Now, when we say patient, uh, many of us tend to think about patience as something passive. You know, like waiting is just, just waiting, just sitting, doing nothing, just waiting for him to come. You see, maybe you're praying and you're doing all the other ibadat and so forth, but you're not doing anything more. You're just being patient. Patient. Uh, patience in, in Islam, sabr, is not like that. Patience or sabr is a dynamic uh, uh, effort. It is not a passive thing. So you, you wait or you are patient in a dynamic way. And what do we mean by in a dynamic way? Well, for one thing, patience is an, act, an inward activity. Patience only begins when you're about to run out of it. If you're sitting like me, for example, I'm sitting right here in front of this, 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 uh, this, this screen and I'm quite comfortable. You know, I don't need to have patience to sit in front of the screen. But if I was to sit here for another, let's say maybe two hours, perhaps three hours, I would get very agitated. I'd be tired sitting down. I'd feel, you know, my, my, my bones might ache or something like that, okay? Now, if I had to sit here for another two hours, if I just had to sit there for another two hours, that means patience. Not now, as I say to some people, patience is when you don't have any more. That's when you have patience, okay? And so we have to be looking at our patience like this. Yeah? When we are confronted with those things that make us, uh, you know, uh, upset, uh, and um, they be, they're becoming more and more uh, invasive in our lives and so on, okay? This patience is something that we have to put into practice. That's one thing. The other thing about patience is that patience is always many times in terms of action, an auxiliary tendency or an auxiliary psychological state that is necessary to have. What do you mean? When you are confronted with a problem, a difficult problem, you have two choices. One choice is that you could leave it and run away from it and you do not attack that problem. And the other one is to persevere in doing this problem. The more you persevere and the more you do not arrive at a solution makes you tax your patience. The patience is, in the, is the perseverance itself and resistance of abandoning the problem. That's the patience. And so you try working it out, it still doesn't solve you bring up even more patience to keep on working at that problem. So patience really means in a dynamic sense, it means perseverance on a path. It is not something passive. And so we have to persevere on a path. And, what, and why do we need this perseverance? Because this is the time when it is very difficult to be religious, to hold on to religion. It's very, very difficult. Imam Ali alayhi salam, the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, said that uh, uh, to be religious, to, be, to hold on to your deen in the last days would be like holding on to hot coals. Like holding on to hot coals. Very, very difficult. And so we have to be patient in our deen. Uh, and in that patience, there are certain 
uh, key things that are mentioned that I think we need to talk about. First of all, um, the Quran. We have to persevere in our relationship with the Quran, in our attachment to the Holy Quran. One of the major signs of the last days uh, or the time coming before the, the coming before the time of the Imam is the fact that the Quran will be used for entertainment or the Quran will be used to adorn a house, but it will not be consulted, it will not be read. And you find today that there are lots of people who would love to go to Quran recitations and it, it's like a it's like uh, going to see a, a, a major entertainment celebrity. You know, you're going to see all these different uh, people who are there to, to listen to Quran and see how long the voice can stretch and so forth and so on. It's a kind of entertainment. Okay? Now, I'm not saying that all of the people who go to these functions are like this. No, it's something subjective. Individuals will see it like this. Okay, so, I'm, so, so yes, it's good to have Quranic recitations. It's good to have competitions with Quranic recitations and so forth. But a lot of people would go to those things who themselves do not have a relationship with Quran. So it's a subjective type of thing. Um, to be able to understand the Quran, to know what the Quran is saying. You know, when you have a closer relationship to the Quran, the Quran becomes your friend. The Quran is actually a spirit, not just a book, it's a spirit. You know, and uh, to prove this, we have hadith that say, uh, when the believer dies and he's in the grave, a uh, beautiful being will emerge from between the shroud and the body. And the deceased will ask that being, which uh, many, verse, many uh, accounts say, it takes the form of a handsome young man. I guess, I don't know, with women, it might be a handsome, uh, a pretty young woman, I don't know. Um, but uh, the believer in the grave would ask that being, who are you? And he would say, I'm the Quran that you used to read. You see, because the believer was attached to the Quran. And he says to this believer, I will be your companion in the grave uh, until the day of judgment. Now, when we say in the grave, we do not mean necessarily the hole in the ground. We mean the life after death um, before the judgment day. Right, the Barzakh. Um, so your Quran, your, your, our, our attachment to the Holy Quran has to be increased, has to be intense. This is one of the parameters that we have to hold on to, yeah, to maintain our relationship with the Quran. One very good way of maintaining a daily relationship with the Quran is to read the Quran after your Fajr prayer every morning, because Allah says it's something that is witnessed by the angels. It's something that is written down for us. So, um, attachment to the Holy Quran is extremely impo important. You know, do not be like some people who want to read Quran only for some kind of uh, festive occasion or some kind, of, some kind of super special occasion. When they get married, you read some Quran. You know, when somebody dies, you read some Quran. When a baby's born, you read some Quran. And apart from that, you do not have a relationship with it. Um, I think it is very important for us to teach our children how to recite Quran um, in the Arabic, you know, and also to understand the Quran in terms of the English, if they are not um, native Arab speakers and so on. Um, and by extension, uh, you find that the last days, the before the coming of the Imam, are days that are characterized by the widespread expanse of unbelief, the widespread expanse of unbelief where uh, in, in, a, in some, in some uh, discussions, it says that some people will be afraid to call the name Allah. They'll be afraid of the name Allah, okay? Um, you know, you have some jokes of, you know, somebody whose son's name is Allah Akbar and they got lost in a, in a store and they're afraid to call the person's name Allah Akbar because it becomes a call of terrorism, you see? Um, uh, but this is a real situation right here, right now. We are free to say Allah Akbar in public, you see, because why? It is a call of terrorism, as uh, our Wahhabi uh, associates, uh, you know, uh, have made it. Um, but even um, the word God, 
even the word prayer, even even the word belief, even the word the word of calling themselves calling oneself religious, are right now words or statements that are a source of great embarrassment for many of our children who are going to school, for many of us who are going to school. And if you look at um, uh, the, the prevent program, you know, one of the quote unquote signs of, of, of Muslim extremism is when for a Muslim who no, normally does not pray starts praying. Okay, so he's praying is something negative, is something odious. This is the kind of environment that we are into. Now, um, as Muslims, we need to be able to understand this. We can't say that it's just how people behave. You know, we have to be able to understand this. And in understanding this, there are certain things that we are to be blamed for in, in this climate. For one thing, for example, we do not try to spread Islam. We do not try to speak to people about Islam. We do not try to show the good aspect of Islam. Huh? We are in school, for example, and you're in school just as a student, any student, you know, you're, you're, you're going for your great marks, this is good, you know, but what about that, that uh, suffering non-Muslim white kid or black kid over there who's having problems in the class in understanding their math or their physics or something like that? Do we reach out to them as a Muslim brother or Muslim sister of that Christian? and try to show them and guide them and help them as much as we can. These are the things that impress upon people. You know, I think Muslims um, have a kind of a standoffish, a lot of Muslims, especially the older generation, you know, have a kind of a standoffish, um, you know, classist, um, even uh, contemptuous attitude towards uh, non-Muslims. You know, they're all Najis, for example. You know, I wouldn't want to invite them to my house because, you know, I dread the idea of them asking me to use a toilet, for example, or to wash their hands in my sink and so on. You know, you have this, this kind of standoffish attitude. And it is not just against uh, non-Muslims. It is also against each other. You know, I know of people, for example, you know, in India, Muslims in India who um, have attitudes towards uh, Muslims in the South, in Kerala and these types of things, okay? So we have a lot of these types of prejudices and, and uh, stereotypes of each other and so on that beset us. And if our houses are so fragmented, we cannot show any kind of unity, any kind of example to the non-Muslims out there. So a large part of their hostility to us is based upon one, their ignorance about us. They don't have real Muslim friends because as a Muslim, you are, you are their friend, but you, you are their friend in according to their terms. You see, according to their terms. So you might be a Muslim boy who might have a girl friend. I mean, girl dash friend, not girlfriend, a girl dash friend, a friend who happens to be a girl, okay? And you would be quite free with them, right? Make all kinds of jokes with them, you know, but you treat your sister uh, in a kind of a standoffish way like if you're afraid of them, you know, salam alaikum sister, if they see you and that's about it, you see? And so we have this type of an attitude and this type of behavior. These types of behaviors do not show Islam. What shows Islam is uh, our care, our concern for our fellow human being, the logic as to why we do what we do. You know, these are the things that are impressive. You know, um, uh, when I was in home, I was talking to some uh, brothers in Colombia, some African American or South, Afri South American Africans uh, in Colombia who were embracing Shia Islam uh, in great numbers. And some of them were in home studying. And I asked them, how did they become Muslim? And they said, some ship, because they were in Medellin, they were in a port city, lived in a port city in Colombia. Some ship came and there were Muslims on board and they made friends with these Muslims and they can talk, you know, Spanish. These guys can talk Spanish like the Colombians, but they can get along. And they would see when the time came to pray, these Muslims would go and pray, right? And they pray in a very distinctive fashion. 
You know, they always see this. And these Muslims are always nice and kind to them and so forth. You know, the next thing, these Colombians started to imitate the Muslims in prayer. They didn't know how to pray, okay? They decided to imitate the Muslims in prayer. Uh, this is how impressive Islamic behavior is. And eventually then, you know, they started to send uh, ulama and so forth, uh, to them and they became Shia Muslims long before Wahhabism started to do any tablet in, um, in Colombia. So um, while we live here in a multicultural environment, it is very important for us to act as ambassadors to Islam. You know, and being ambassadors to Islam is not just about talking. It's not just about talking about Tawheed. It's not just about putting down the Bible as something that is, you know, distorted and, and, and arguing with people like if you're in a speaker's corner about whether God is free or God is one. No, the most important thing that you do is to act as a reformer. And I will get to that topic later on, a reformer, okay? A, person, a doer of good, a person who empowers others, a person who stands up for justice in their society you know, these are things that are very important. A person who looks out for the oppressed because that's what our imam is coming for. If you're not oppressed, then you're an oppressor. There, there's no two ways about it. If you're not oppressed, then you're an oppressor because if you're not oppressed, it means that that system in which you're living with is very, very favorable to you, all right? And being oppressed and being an oppressor doesn't have any kind of relationship, literally, with your bank account, all right? It is your objective and subjective position in the scheme of things. And if you see that scheme of things to your benefit and only to your benefit, and you see no negativity about it, you are, you are part of the, oppress, the oppressors, okay? And he's not coming to you, he's coming to others. So we have to ally ourselves with the oppressor, with the oppressed. We have to ally ourselves with them. We have to take this, our stand as much as we can. You know, and this is what makes us uh, uh, Mahdawi, because we will be behaving like him. And I guess maybe as, because I'm on the topic already, I was probably putting this for last, but I will bring it up uh, uh, right up to the front, you know, which another um, uh, characteristic that we need to, to nurture is the characteristic of uh, being ref a reformer, a Muslim. The Imam is a Muslim. Okay, he's here to to bring change, he's coming to bring change. He's coming to change people's behaviors and thoughts, you know, to more constructive thoughts and better behaviors. He's here to fight, he's here to fight um, intellectually and physically, material, uh, militaristically. He's here to fight against the systems of oppression and free the world of oppression. We, have to be able to do something like that. You know, um, when you think about leaders and followers, we all like to think of ourselves as followers of the Imam. A, a follower is nothing but an extension of the leader, a psychological extension and a practical extension. That's a true follower. When you follow somebody, you can either follow them involuntarily, like you're in the military, for example, you can do that. That's not a true follower. You can follow them um, slavishly. You, you think they should be followed, but uh, you just follow them without thinking. Just whatever they say, that they say to do, you can do. Or you can follow them uh, creatively, practically, uh, and see yourself as, or try to be an extension of that person. Try to be an extension of that person, okay? I'll give you an example between the slavish follower and the uh, creative follower, the thinking follower. The leader tells follower A, the slavish follower, do X. Follow, the follower A goes out and he does X and he does nothing more than what he was told and he sits or he comes back and says X is done and he's waiting for another order. Okay? That's a, that's a follower. There's no doubt about it. Okay? 
And that person, if he's following an imam like this, he is on the right side. But there's other, there are other followers. There are followers like, you know, Hisham, the, uh, the acolyte or the disciple of Hazrat Imam Sadiq, all right, who was a young man. When he got the lessons from the imam, he would go out and he would teach these, letter, these lessons or engage in debates with this knowledge and defeat the enemies of, the, of, this, of, of Shia Islam, okay? That type of follower is a follower who anticipates the needs of the leader, who can uh, uh, almost receive a projection from what the leader desires and goes out and does it you know, without, being need, without it being needed for him to be asked. That type of follower himself could become a leader. So imagine you're in a, in, a, in a military platoon or a military company and the captain gets shot and killed. Huh? Who is supposed to, 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 to step into the shoes of the captain? Maybe a, a lieutenant, you see? But among the lieutenants, there would be one who was, who was captain material. He was the one the captain would talk to and, 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 and uh, bounce ideas off and so forth because he's an independent thinker as well. He's on the same page as the captain. That person will become a better leader. So we have to be like our imam. You cannot be a follower of someone if you're not like them in some respect. And to be like the imam, it means that you have to be out there standing up for justice in whatever capacity you have, you know, calling to task um, uh, whatever contradictions that might be existing in society. Like now, for example, in, 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 during this time of coronavirus, you know, where our leaders, our so-called leaders are uh, making these mistakes all over the place, you know, when their, their, their interests are not really with us, the oppressed, but with the oppressors, where they'd be more concerned about uh, uh, making sure that big business does not lose its, uh, its money as opposed to the, 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 the smaller fry in society. You know, so we have a, a, a need and a, a, a tendency, or we should have this, to be able to do that. The Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wa Ali said, in a very, po uh, very popular hadith, notable among Shias and Sunnis, where he says, when a Muslim is confronted, or when a believer is confronted with, a, with an evil or an injustice, they must first try to change it with their hands, meaning take direct action and change it in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a direct way. And if they cannot do so, then they should speak against it or about it with their tongues. And if they cannot do so, they should hate that thing in their hearts. And he says, that is the least of your man. In other words, when you see oppression and you do not hate it in your heart, you have no faith. You have no faith whatsoever. When you see it and you dislike it, then you have the minimum of faith because faith should spur you to action. And the next level of action is intellectualizing that thing, is understanding that thing. This is why it says, speak out with it, speak out against it with your tongue. The tongue is the means of understanding. You know, we, we think with our intellectual tongues. Yeah. So that means we have to read the newspaper. We have to be able to look at the news on TV in, a, in, a, in, a, in an analytical fashion. We have to be able to cut through the, uh, the fake news, as Trump would like to say. You have to cut through the fake news. You have to cut through the spin, you see, and arrive at the truth. You have to be people who are aware of social phenomena, of political phenomena. It is not sufficient to just be aware of Palestine, brothers and sisters. It's not sufficient just to be aware of what's happening in Kashmir and so forth. It's very, very important, even, even pri primary for us to know what is happening in our environment because we are here and we have to act like the Imam in our environment. You know, like Eid al-Fitr, and by the way, you know, uh, Eid Mubarak to all of you, 
Eat the fruit has come. Uh, we pay our fit three years. Many of us in our society send all of our money to the land of our forefathers. Okay? Many of us do this. We do not spend any money here. Why? You know, and you're walking with a British passport. What does it mean? It means you got no care for this environment right here. None whatsoever. You have no care for your, your, your for this, these are your people, you know? These are your people. You know, do you think your people have to be uh, just Muslims? You know, when, we, when the Holy Quran talks about sending Hajjat Saleh and Hajjat Lut and Hajjat Hud and so on to their people, how would he describe them? As their brothers, their brothers, and they cared for them. That's why they came and they preached to them and tried to get them to reform because they loved them. Okay? And it, is, it requires that type of, of, of a psychology to be able to be effective in this society. But many of us, we do not think like this. We think that this is, a, this is Kufristan. This is the place where the Kufar live. You think, you think Pakistan is any different? You know, who's, who's running there? You know, you think America isn't running there? You know, you think Iraq is any different? Big, big, big example. Hmm? This idea of the spread of injustice all over the world does not exclude the Muslim countries, you know. And in fact, Muslim countries can even be worse than these Kufar countries, these, these non-Muslim countries. Yeah. So we have to strive to be on that type of a wavelength. Um, the other aspect is uh, with respect to akhlaq. With respect to akhlaq, there are lots of uh, signs that uh, talk about the, the depreciation of akhlaq among people. One most repetitive or most repeated sign is the relationship between the sexes. It talks about the rise of homosexuality, you know, it becoming normalized, you know, in this society and it becoming a culture. When it talks about, for example, men dressing like women or women dressing like men, this is this type of, uh, 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 what they call it now, gender fluidity, which is just simply a, 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 a fancy word to make you feel good about it, all right? Again, remember, we have to be able to, be able to dissect these types of think thinking, you know, um, this is what this culture becomes. It does not stay in its box, all right? It's, some, it's something that goes beyond its, 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 uh, its limitations and impacts upon us. So it talks about this type of thing. And therefore we have to be able to take a stand about it, okay? We don't have to be, um, how should I say, hateful. You don't have to hate gays. You know, you don't have to hate people like that at all. You know, but you have to talk about the reality of things. You have to talk about the fact that, you know, we, uh, we insist upon at least having our right, you know, to educate our kids the way we think that our kids should be educated and so forth. Right now we are in a situation, literally, where they are poised to uh, brainwash your kids, to program your kids starting from the age of four. What are we doing about this? We are doing nothing, okay? So here again, we are becoming part of the problem, part of the problem in the sense that these problems exist and we do nothing about it. Um, along with these uh, sexual problems that we have um, would be the spread of illegitimate children. We see this again as, as an issue in society. Um, where, uh, you know, there are so many children born out of wedlock, so many children who don't know their fathers, who their fathers are, you know, and you find a lot of these kids becoming involved in things like crime, violent crime and so forth. You know, now, um, you know, in Islam, uh, especially Shia Islam, uh, it talks about the people in the army of the Dajjal being people of illegitimate birth. But first of all, I'd like to tell you that this is not a, a cause to discriminate against 
children of illegitimate birth. There's not a reason to do that. It talks about things in general, that the majority of the people in the ranks of the Dajjal's army are going to be people of illegitimate birth. Why is this? Because you find that many people who are, are, are from illegitimate birth not knowing their fathers. Now, according to Islamic fiqh, um, uh, common law relationships among people who are not Muslims are recognized as um, marriages. Okay, common law relationships are recognized as marriages, not among Muslims, but among non-Muslims. If, if that is the one of the major means whereby people interrelate interrelate with each other in a society like this one. You know, you have a man and a woman, they haven't been married, but they've been living together for 25 years. They raise up kids, they send their kids to school and so forth. This is considered a marriage. What do you mean by illegitimate kids, right? Uh, kids who are the product of things like one night stands. You know, kids whose um, parents, their mother got involved in a relationship that really had no base, you know, no commitment, okay? Like for example, after they go to a nightclub or or, or to a, a pub or something like that the next six, nine months afterwards or six, three months afterwards, they realize they're pregnant or something a week, a month after. You know, um, uh, we talk, we're talking about this type of thing where you have kids growing up in single parent households who do not have a male presence to give them some kind of discipline, to give them some kind of balance in their lives, okay? And this is the kind of people who uh, many of them um, not being able to find a, a, a way of, of solving this, for example, they end up doing crime and so forth and so on, motivated by a rage and a, dis and a, and a hate, you know, that they do not know where it is coming from, okay? So uh, we Muslims ourselves have to be careful in not producing children who are for the Dajjal. Um, uh, it talks about uh, huge uh, amounts of wealth that people would have where they squander it in uh, frivolous activity, activities hated by God, you know? And this has become a kind of a culture, you know, when you have programs like, for example, Keeping Up With The Kardashians and, um, you know, the lives of the rich and famous and so forth and so on you know, come take a look at my lily white pad, you know, with my uh, $1 million bed and so forth and so on. Uh, what, is, what does this do? It makes, it makes this a kind of a normalized type of uh, experience. It makes people think about getting money or getting a job to get these types of things. It also distracts kids and makes them think that, look, okay, if I get a job as a doctor, I still can't get a $16 million house, you know, so I might as well try to be a football star or a rap artist or something like that, you know, and especially with a lot of, uh, you know, children in depressed households, like black kids and so forth, this has become the two major um, uh, or three major activities, uh, possibly economic activities for them, right? Either being a, an entertainer, uh, an athlete, or sell drugs. That's about the only three alternatives that they have. You know, this is in part because of discriminatory practices in the school system itself, right? Where they actually, you know, push kids to go into particular screams, streams of, of, uh, of studies that are not useful for them. You know, and also combined with that, the promotion of a lot of uh, lifestyles that you know, strike the fancy of these kids and make them want to get quick money um, in the shortest possible space of time. Um, backbiting is another aspect. Okay, backbiting, you find a lot of the media involved in official backbiting. The media basically sets the whole, the whole scene. It sets the culture of the society in which you want which you find ourselves. And this is very important. You know, if the media does this and we want to reform society, we want to counteract this, we have to create a media ourselves. We have to create media ourselves. 
You know, we have to come up with our own television networks. We have to come up with our own, um, uh, uh, you know, tabloids, you know, that says something better. You know, we have to come up with our own uh, blogs and our own, um, you know, uh, chat room, discussion groups, et cetera, et cetera. You know, and uh, we have to be very strategic about it. You know, it does not necessarily have to be an in your face kind of Islam type of thing. It doesn't have to be like that because you're actually ending up streaming away from this, excluding from, from this people who say I'm not into religion. It has to be done in such a, a subtle way that it can appeal to everyone and especially with its high values. You know, when the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said that you have to speak out, of, out, of, out, of, uh, out against oppression, what he's talking about is this, is to be to being creative, not just using the tongue in your head, but the tongue of your pen. You know, the, you could be a screenwriter, a script writer, a journalist, you know, an analyst and so forth. Unfortunately, unfortunately in our, um, our Muslim environment, because we are so hell bent on making money um, and nothing else, uh, our Muslim parents do not encourage our children to be artists. We do not encourage our children to be writers. They always encourage them to be, to be some kind of money-making machine. Like, you know, it's good to be an accountant. It's good to be a pharmacist. Oh, definitely a doctor. Engineer is all right. You know, what else do you have? You know, very, very few things. But if a child goes up to his parent or a child starts to show, let's say, uh, good artistic abilities or... Um, you know, they are really good with literature and storytelling or writing poetry and so forth. And they tell their parents the haram words, dad, mom, I want to go to university. I want to study fine arts. Or I want to study English literature or something like that. The parents looked at them and said, are you crazy? You know, how are we going to live? And they might be right because they have created, they have created an environment where women, single girls, are looking for men who are not artists. They're looking for doctors, they're looking for lawyers, they're looking for uh, you know, accountants and so forth. Now, who, who creates the mental images for society? Who actually gives society culture? Who actually creates culture? It's not the doctor, it's not the engineer, it's not the accountant, it's not the pharmacist, okay? it's the playwright. You know, it's the, it's the journalist, it's the artist who does this. You know, and so you as a doctor also start to think like how they program you to think because they do it through the media, through entertainment, okay? And through art and so forth. The more and more we Muslims dissuade our children from expressing their natural talent in the field of arts, the more and more we shoot ourselves in the foot. We shoot ourselves in the foot. Because the less newspapers we'll have, the less Islamic shows we'll have. In fact, our Islamic shows are going to be boring. It's just talking heads, blah, blah, like this one here right now, just talking blah, 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 blah. That's it. What are you talking about? You know, everything, quote unquote, Islamic under the sun. But when it comes to analyzing your society, when it comes to in indicating the people, to people, who are the good guys and who are the bad guys and so forth, we are at a loss. We don't know what to do. So um, being aware and being able to express this awareness in a fashion where other people can understand is a very important criterion, a very important characteristic that a Muslim should have. And I know this from experience, brothers and sisters. You know, I grew up uh, for most of my teenage life in Canada and the United States, you know, and I've seen the impact that Islam has upon a population when the Muslims stand up for people. Yeah, I know of people who would go into, uh, you know, uh, some of the roughest parts of New York City, you know, where people are um, suffering police brutality, you know, and go there and monitor police and, uh, you know, fight for them in court fight for the people who have been oppressed by police in court. I've known people who uh, go into areas where it is rife with drug dealing, where people would sit on the floor to eat, not because they're Muslim, they sit on the floor to eat because they were sitting at a table 
a stray bullet might come in the window and take out one of them. So they sit on the floor for security, for safety, you know, and Muslims will come and clean up that neighborhood. And this is what made people Muslims, okay? When you, when you look at the, how Muslims, the Muslims uh, uh, took over Spain, you know, and held on to it for over 700 years. You know, one of the reasons why the Muslims were so successful is because Islam had a reputation as being a religion of justice. And the people of Spain who were laboring under the uh, oppression of the rulers of the time, the Visigoths, welcomed the Muslims to liberate them from this. The same thing with Iran, with Persia, when the Muslims fought and took over Persia, you see? And uh, this, is, this is, a, is a theme that we know in history is the secret weapon to the spread of Islam. So, um, you know, um, in a nutshell then, uh, we, we have to follow these particular paradigms. We have to follow these particular paradigms. And if we do this, I think we'll be very, very successful. Um, we are coming close to seven o'clock. I'd like to stop here. And uh, if there are any questions or any comments, I'm ready to take it. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Hassan Sun Sheikh, thank you very, very much for your, for your lecture. Very inspirational. And what actually reson resonated with me was kind of seeing that it's not only kind of the Western world that's undergoing this form of cultural degradation but sadly it's our own muslim worlds you see like in saudi arabia for example the normalization of clubbing discos you know the kind of tourism industry and attracting people all around the world kind of through through illicit means it's very very sad to see um and the fact that sadly kind of our our muslim youth you know all around the world are unfortunately many people are being sucked into this as well it's truly really tragic and we look around and we see what's going on and and Inshallah, you know, I hope for many of us this time of coronavirus has caused us to reflect and realize how much we need the Imam at this time. The world is is coming apart. You look at just how you know a pandemic that that started with a with a quite a you know a relatively small outbreak in China has spread and disabled the whole world. We need some kind of support because humans were so so we're so weak and fragile uh, in our minds. Uh, and and uh, physically and you know as the Akumel says you know like the frailty of our bones for example we don't have the capability to deal with these things so we pray uh, for the for the the quick zuhur of Imam Zaman Allah um, I do have some questions for you and um, that have, have come in through our WhatsApp and Facebook. Um, excuse the sniffling, I am suffering from some hay fever, so I'll try try to keep my voice as, as clear as possible. So uh, the question is, Salaam Alaikum, uh, what is the best way for kids to be the Imam's followers and helpers? What are some relatable and practical ways kids or young people can create an impact on our society uh, when they're still dependent on adults? That's the first question. Um, I remember when I was uh, 13 and 14 and 15, um, I was quite uh, aware of my environment and quite aware, aware of who was right and who was wrong, very much so. I think uh, we, need, we need to tap back into that. We need to remember that we went through that, you know, and we went through that with a certain level of consciousness. One of the things that attracts kids' uh, attention and kids' fascination would, is leadership. Leadership in, 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 in promoting justice. Kids love heroes, you know? You need to read to them about their heroes. You know, Imam Hussein, alayhi salam, you know, Ali, alayhi salam, all of them, and also contemporary heroes, especially contemporary heroes, because this is where their main... Uh, Mm, how should I say, the ulgu, you know, their main models come from. So like, for example, with my kids, you know, I immerse them in stories like Malcolm X. Now you might think Malcolm X, yeah, he's a black hero and stuff like that. He might not have much relevance to me as a non-black person. That's very uh, in much an error. You know, I remember um, growing up in Canada, which was becoming more liberal, um, uh, in, in the 70s and, in, and uh, opening its borders to people from different uh, ethnic groups before Canada was like 
uh, Australia was in the 60s, you know, um, being very, very selective in who it would admit. It would only admit Western Europeans and not just any Western European, but Northern Western Europeans. In other words, they'd be restrictive towards Italians and, and Spanish. They'd have a tough time getting into Canada and Australia because they were darker Europeans. They wanted the light ones, you know. But anyway, so you had all these Pakistanis and Indians and Caribbean people coming in, you know, and uh, uh, I remember some of the Pakistani kids in my time you know, um, hanging around the black kids you know, because the black kids have more attitude and stuff like that. So they need to feed off of some of that to get some power in the, the environment, you know. And they found out that these black kids love Malcolm X. They actually love Malcolm X. And when they looked into Malcolm X, they said, wow, he's a Muslim like me, you see. And this gave them a huge boost, you see. So I think they need to, to, to study the, 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 the people of history in our environment. You know, and that history in our environment is not only a Muslim history, okay? There are other people who you could learn from. Like, for example, I don't know, Martin Luther King. I mean, I'm coming up with some black examples because that's many of those of who I know or come to my mind. But um, you have the suffragettes, the women suffragettes in, 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 uh, who are fighting for equal rights. You could learn from that, you see? And this helps them on that path. It helps, this helps them on that particular path. The other thing I think you can do with your children, I think you need to take them out, take them out in, on camps. I really think you need to take them out on camps, you know, and create an, as much as an Islamic environment as possible in that camp. And in that camp, you, you, you teach them leadership, you see? So you could have, for example, rotating leadership for the person in your tent or rotating leadership for, let's say, uh, the Amir of the day or something like that. You know, these types of things have to bring out from kids leadership capabilities. Um, by and large, then, I think, I think in, 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 in total, you need to have a constant program for your children, all right? One or, twi or two, two evenings a week, at least, to be supplemented by um, uh, weekend programs that are of longer duration. Let's say, for example, half day on Saturday, you know, maybe all day on Sunday or something like that. And then uh, to top that off with at least a two week camp outside of civilization, the rougher the camp, the better, the less posh the camp is, the better, you know, and these types of things become very, very important in uh, training kids. And you do not just train kids in reading Quran and in learning Hadith and learning how to make du'as and so forth. Yes, that's good, but you also train, train them in being uh, discriminatory, to be able to look at your society and, and to, be, be able, to be able to discriminate between what is right and what is wrong. You know, you have to start teaching them about politics. Yes, politics, you know, not necessarily about being a Labour Party member or conservative, no. Politics in terms of the art of knowing who has power over you, if that power is just or unjust, and what power can you have to change the justice into the unjust, the injustice into justice? You need to have that type of a program um, with your kids, so that when they're growing up, they become more discriminatory and they are more grounded in Islam. Stand some Sheikh. Um, there is another question here, just kind of uh, somewhat related to what you mentioned about kind of Malcolm X and other other famous leaders. So the question is. Which method would you suggest is the best way to lift a race out of stereotypes uh, when other races and even members within their own race look upon them in kind of a stereotypical way? So I think it's if certain groups are subject to racism, how can they counteract this from within? What kind of is, is, is your response to that? Well, yeah, that's kind of easy, you know. Um, people stereotype you because they don't know you. That's number one. Number two is, uh, you know the stereotypes already, you know, so they don't, they're not surprising you with anything. And number three, you act against those, those stereotypes. For example, I'm a tall guy, you know, I'm six foot one and a half, you know, um, uh, somebody look at me and say, oh, I bet you are into basketball. And I tell them, no, I like golf. <laughs> That's before Tiger Woods. <laughs> that is choice, that stereotype. You know, or um, I bet you like going out dancing. I, no, I don't. I like staying at home, praying. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, 
that destroys the stereotype. You see? Um, so stereotypes are pretty easy to break. And just remember, stereotypes are things that are a replacement for knowledge. They don't know you. And so therefore, you need to introduce yourself to them. I mean, in practice, you see? So if they say, for example, sometimes, you know, like, you know, um, you know most, uh, let's say, Muslims are misogynist, okay? That's a stereotype. Well, they haven't met your wife yet or they haven't met your sister yet, you see? They haven't seen you interact with women yet. I don't mean, I mean, interact with women on a respectable basis and so forth. This breaks the stereotype, you know? So basically, I think it's just being yourself, being a good Muslim, all right? And also being a useful person to others, okay? is something that would break a stereotype. And in fact, what you'd be end up, you end up doing is you would end up creating a different uh, impression of Muslims to other people. So when somebody says, oh, those, all those Muslims just hate women, they'll say, no, no, no. I remember, you know, brother X or brother Y, who I was, was good friends with me. I met his family and so forth. And not all Muslims are like this. I think this is the best way. Thank you, Sheikh. Um, I mean, I'm six foot three, so I get the, the basketball uh, <laughs> references all the time. I mean, we're all used to it, but Alhamdulillah, I guess we, we take it as, a, as compliments. Um, so there is another uh, question here. Um, and also, sorry, just before I come on to that, that those of you that are on Facebook that are watching on Zoom, and we want to, like, you know, we've already had questions, obviously, and we do have others coming, but we want to make this as interactive as possible. So please type your questions in the chat, type them on the comments on Facebook, send them to uh, the, our WhatsApp number as well, and then we can relay them to Sheikh, inshallah. And also, if, if, if you want to just turn your mic on and just put forward a, a, your viewpoint and to, to kind of get into a bit of a, a debate or a discussion, that would be very, very much appreciated, inshallah. Just because we're separated from each other physically doesn't mean that, you know, we have to go back into our shells inshallah this is a good opportunity for us to uh bring back some you know a little bit more uh dynamic community spirit inshallah uh, so there is another question here sheikh if i may um if muslims if muslims demonstrated good ethics when they conquered spain then why don't we see any sign of islam when muslims left spain Yeah, that's a very good question. Well, um, for one thing, um, success sometimes is the biggest corrupter of people. Huh? Uh, and they were very successful and they had their dynasties and so forth. And after a while, uh, power became the most important impetus for, for Islam, for the Muslims, holding on to power. And in holding on to power, they started to oppress other people. You know, and so these Muslims, after a while, they started to fight among themselves. You had different power groups, different sultanates and so forth in Spain that started to fight among themselves. And in fighting among themselves, they would use mercenaries or forces from the Spanish Christians to fight against each other. And eventually they became weak and they disintegrated. I think it's a very important lesson for us to learn, you know, that success and power could be in itself a very, very powerful temptation that could distract us from our deen. You know, what is a hadith that says the last prophet to enter into paradise would, have, would be Hazrat Suleiman. And the reason why, because he was the richest and most powerful prophet that there were. Sansum Sheikh, thank you very much. Um, I actually have, uh, have I've jotted down a few questions myself, so if I may, um, kind of in terms of our relationship with the Imam, because he's been in Ghaiba for so long, I think we often maybe can't imagine that he is a real individual like us, and, and Ghaiba is almost to us quite a supernatural concept, but so, so my question is kind of, is the, is the 12th Imam amongst us, and kind of, can we communicate with him, obviously, with Dua, and when we we pray for his reappearance, we do that. 
um, but how much, to what extent can we communicate with him? Is there a possibility even um, of us seeing him at some point in our lives? Do you know, many of us, we visit Masjid al-Sahla, for example, uh, and another Masjid in Iraq and Iran, Masjid Jamkaran as well, with kind of th this hope of, of, of creating this very, very deep spiritual connection with the Imam. Um, so kind of what are the, what are the issues around that? Uh, yeah, um, the Ghaiba is not the Imam being hidden from us. It is, it is us being hidden from the Imam. And uh, we are hidden from the Imam because of um, the fact that we do not share an affinity with him. When I say we do not share an affinity with him, it, it goes back to exactly what I was talking about, you know, perfecting our akhlaq, for example. Um, standing up for justice and so forth and so on, right? These things are create an affinity. You know, you're, you're like him, like likes like. You see, um, and uh, it is possible that we could be graced with a vision of the Imam. Now, um, all of the people, right, with few exceptions, who have seen the Imam, say nothing. They don't say a thing. Why? Because if they say something, people are going to adulate them. People are going to make them famous. People make them this and that. You know, and this goes completely opposite to the Reba. That makes him unknown. All right? He is among us. He is in this earth. He's on this earth. He's not like Hazrat Isa, for example, who went to another heaven, for example. You know, or... Um, uh, uh, Enoch, I believe it is, uh, Hazrat Idris, I believe, who's also in another heaven. Okay, he's like, he's like his, the Imam. They are on this earth, but they are not known, you know, and they could be right among us. They are always, he's always in Hajj, for example, you know, and if you look, uh, you listen, to this, listen to some people, there are many, many very humble, normal people I've seen the Imam. I know one woman who um, used to come to the Islamic Center of England who took me aside and said to me a story. She said, you know, she, this lady, this lady goes to Hajj every year. Okay. And the last minute I asked her, I said, Auntie, you got your visa yet? She says, no, she says, but I'm going. And she always ends up going. And, I, and one day she said to me, you know, one day she was in Saudi Arabia, she was in Hajj, and uh, she just finished the the Duhar, the Duhar and Asr prayers, the Duhar prayer, and, uh, <coughs> excuse me, and um, she lost a slipper, and by that time, the courtyard was quite hot, and she was standing there wondering, how am I going to cross this courtyard, and uh, she said, all of a sudden, she saw a young Arab man walk up to her, you know, looking very nice in his dash dasha and so on. He says to her, um, mother, which is a word of respect, what seems to be the problem? Excuse me a sec. <coughs> I have a little bit of allergies myself. What seems to be the problem? And she says, I can't go over there. It, it, it's too hot and I lost my slippers. He bent down and he said, try these on. And he gave her a pair of shoes. When she looked down, the shoes were female shoes of her size. When she looked up, the person was gone, disappeared. She said she has knee problems. Every time she puts on these slippers, her knee problems go away. This is the imam. Okay? He only realized he was the imam usually after he's gone. We pray that Allah gives us this tawfiq to see him. Right, and also the uh, the the means for us to keep our mouths shut. <laughs> but I really thank that sister for um, letting me know this, you know. But it is real, um, and I think if we uh, if we are in the struggle for spreading justice, that in itself gives us a sense of feeling that the Imam is with you. That in itself. But when one is in the struggle, you know, that uh, materialization of that help becomes more prominent. You know, take, for example, the struggle of the, um, 
uh, the resistance in Lebanon against the Zionist invasion. Take, for example, the uh, struggle of uh, the Iranian uh, uh, soldiers against uh, the uh, Iraqi invasion. All of them had many, many stories of the Imam coming in in some way or fashion and helping them to overcome. So uh, a, a, good, a good way of trying to activate the Imam's presence in your life is to be active out there, you know, in terms of spreading justice as much as we can and knowledge and to be close to our Holy Quran, close to the, to the, to the, to the, to the Salah and also uh, try to activate our personal akhlaq. Sen, thank you very, very much, Sheikh. Subhanallah. Uh, those were some beautiful narrations, some lovely examples you gave. Uh, and thank you for, again, reiterating on those, those wonderful practical points that you made during the lecture. And um, there is a question from uh, one brother. So, Assalamu alaikum, uh, our great Sheikh. Uh, what is the best way to keep our Shia community united and together nowadays? Um, the best way to keep our Shia community united is for us to get out of our ethnocentric ghettos. To get out of our ethnocentric ghettos. All right? I mean, many of us, we think Pakistani when we think about our deen. We think in Indian when we think about our deen. We think Iraqi when we think about our deen. We do not think British. And I don't mean British in the negative sense. I mean British in the, in the, in the circumstantial sense that we live here in this society. You know, we have to be aware that Islam is both a belief and also a culture. And the cultural aspect of Islam is something variable. It's as variable as the color of the dress of a bride. It might be red in Pakistan and it might be white in New York City. All right? You know, um, uh, and so culture is uh, a dynamic interrelationship between Islamic principles and your social environment. And out of that comes a particular type of outward practice of Islam that is variable. Right. For example, what, how, what kind of clothes you wear? You see, uh, could you dress Westerner and still follow principles of dressing Islam? Of course you can. OK, um, uh, these types of things make our community more viable, more dynamic. All right. When I say we are thinking a ghettoized type of a way, you know, you walk into like, for example, one of these ethnic madrasas or, or uh, massages and centers. All right. And English is marginalized. English is that special program that you have just for the kids. And it's changing now because you have more and more uh, youth who uh, demand uh, English more and more. But you find that type of a phenomenon taking place. All right. I think for us to have a homegrown Islam, uh, we need to have uh, houses here to train our own students right here. You see, and houses that are dynamic in the sense that uh, they, not, they don't just teach us only about the basics that we need to know, but also how to apply it to the society in which we live. This is what kind of Islam we need. You know, we need an Islam that is, I say tech savvy. We need an Islam that is willing to go out on the, on the front line and proclaim its truth. We need, and, and they find Shias that don't behave like this. Shias do not behave like this, unfortunately. You know, Shias are very, very introverted, I notice. You know, I think that might go back to their uh, uh, historical trauma as, my, as oppressed minorities in the Muslim world. But here it's different. Here, the bazaar of ideas is open to all. You know, we don't step into that void. Uh, or into that breach and fill it. You know, we need our kids, for example, to be committed to our Shiaism. We need to bring them up with that type of a commitment. And to do that, we need to be able to represent the world in which they live. 
and analyze it and describe it for them in a way that would empower them. I mean, like for example, me as a black young man growing up in Iran with, with, with kids, for example, you know, and I tell you, tell you the truth, in my subjective experience, I have seen more racism in the East than I've seen in the West. You know, fortunately, the racism in the East is more aesthetic. You know, they just don't like dark, like white, even among like Indians and Pakistanis. You know, everybody's wanting to, a lot of women want to apply all these white skin whitening creams to themselves and stuff like that, right? So you got that thing going on. So I know my kids are growing up in an environment like this. I don't want them to hate themselves. I don't want them to see themselves as some kind of deficient being. So when they would come home from school, I would get, I would debrief them. What did you learn in school today? You know, oh, did they say that uh, Shaitan was a dark person? Oh, well, no, no, Shaitan is not a dark person. Shaitan is made of smokeless fire. He's neither dark nor white, for example. Things like that, you see. Um, tell them about, about, about prophets that look black, for example, Hajat Musa, a lot of people don't know this, right? Or you know, among Imams, you know, uh, with the last, uh, right after Imam Wada, all the way down, they all had like African mothers, for example, you know, so they look more like me, like anybody else, you see? I teach my kids that. Not that I want to make them black conscious, no, I want to counteract the negative influences upon them. Your kids will be going to school right now and they'll be coming back home talking about my, me and my two dads and me and my two moms. And you have to be able to deprogram them from these types of things. This helps to make a better Muslim community. When you have a community that shares these beliefs and shares an, a, 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 a discourse or an ability to speak about these things in such a way that the youth can gravitate towards it and they can understand it, then you're on the way of building a community. Building a community, therefore, uh, is, it requires an investment in the young generation. You know, we have to bring up our young generation not to be ethnocentrics. Yes, respect and, 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 and give value to the uh, ethnicity and the history and the background of your fathers, okay? Have an Urdu program in your masjid. Have a Farsi program in your masjid. But the lingua franca of that masjid should be English. And if it was in, if it was in Beijing, it would be Chinese. You see? So when they walk into there, they do not feel that they're in a foreign country. You see? Or when they walk past it, they're not afraid to go in. And, not, and being afraid to go in leaves them susceptible to Islamophobic ideas. This is how we must train our children. And then in that way, I think we could be quite successful. Santam Sheikh, very, very much agree with, with uh, what you've said there. Thank you. Um, the questions are, alhamdulillah, continually coming in. Um, and uh, once again, I would encourage all the brothers and sisters that are watching to please forward us your questions uh, regarding the 12th Imam, regarding any other topics uh, that the Sheikh um, so eloquently brought up. And there were many topics brought up during, uh, during the lecture. So please, please uh, do send us your questions, inshallah. Uh, so one very interesting question here from a brother is, uh, why is the concept of the 12th Imam in Islam kept so concealed from our Sunni brothers, as in concealed by uh, the clergy and the leadership within the, the Ahlul Sunnah sect? Um, I would disagree with that. The concept of the 12th, well, the concept of the Imam himself is not something that is uh, alien to Sunnis, not at all. You find that Islamic history uh, is full of people who um, claimed to be uh, the Imam of the time. You know, like for example, the Mahdi of Sudan, you know? So it's not something alien. Um, uh, however, it is something that uh, us Shias pay more attention to. And I think it's quite understandable because we uh, represent in a more complete sense, the final faith revealed to mankind which is the, the deen of Islam. And this deen of Islam is very much, because it's a final phase, the final deen, it will talk at length about things like eschatology, you know, life after death, what's happening in the grave, the day of judgment and so forth and so on. In general, Shias and Sunnis are quite extensive about that. When you look at Christianity that came before us, very little stuff they say about uh, the, 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 
heaven and hell, you know, Judaism, the same thing and so on. You know, and also this issue that we are now in a state where we have to, uh, we have to confront a worldwide uh, case of oppression and so forth. You know, uh, you'd find that before in earlier on in Sunnism, you would have um, millenarian type of types of movements taking place, but this is no longer the case. Um, the the existence of the Imam Mahdi is something that is kind of you know accepted, but uh, none of them are in a state of intidar or waiting. You know, it is us. So I think this is something very good for us. But no, it's not something alien to Sunnism at all. Thank you for the clarification for your answer, Sheikh. Um, another question here uh, regarding uh, one of the things that you discussed um, was, uh, what is the best way of explaining Islamic views uh, regarding LGBT to non-Muslims? Uh, the best way of explaining Islamic uh, uh, views to, uh, about LGBT, I think it's quite, um, it's, it's, it's quite clear, you know, that God made us, or we are born with two, one of two sexes, male or female. We are born like this. Even if you have somebody who has, let's say, for example, hermaphroditic appearances, let's say, undescended testes, for example, okay? Um, uh, chromosomically, you can identify whether they are male or female. And in fact, some people who have both, uh, let's say, uh, uh, let's say reproductive organs, all right? One of them can, you know, uh, how should I say, sire a child. One of them could produce a child, the other one can't. You can't have somebody who has both male and female genitalia and both of them are equally functioning now, okay? So basically we are born in two genders. That's one thing, all right? And that the way of procreation is between these two genders. The other thing is that the two genders of human beings uh, represent certain of the names of God, certain of the names of God, because remember, God created the heavens and the earth as a, in a form of self-disclosure. All of them are signs, in other words, that reflect God, that point to God. You know, so the, the bigness of a, of, a, of a mountain represents the majesty, the jalal of Allah. You know, the uh, beauty of a rose represents the beauty of Allah you see, and so forth and so on. And uh, human beings are the ultimate in God's self-disclosure. Because human beings are described by what? How God breathed his ruh into us, okay? And so the relationships between the sexes, between male and female, um, reflect that. And that when we come together in marriage, the marriage is something that is generated from that bliss, the that pleasure of marriage, that bliss of marriage is something that leads, that comes from this, okay? When we look at the other ones, what do you call it? LGBT plus, what does that plus mean? That plus means it can go to all kinds of variants. There's no end to it. So what it does, it confuses people's understanding and it creates chaos where there is order. Right now, for example, we see the chaos. You know, uh, you walk into a toilet, a, a, a woman walks into a female toilet, she sees a man there, beard, a man, okay? Who is this person? What's he doing here? Oh, he declared he was a woman half an hour ago. So he has a right to be there. This is ridiculous kind of things that are happening. You see, and what it's doing, it's doing is creating confusion. You know, and confusion is what is reigning in this society today. These are some of the things that you, you, could, you could talk about. 
you know, um, I think, you know, if you are interested in something like that, you study it, you know, you study the arguments, you know, and from that studying of the arguments, you get your own argument as well. But remember, always when you're arguing with somebody, argue with respect, regardless of who your opponent is, always argue with respect. Okay, and when that person starts to become more abusive and so forth, and most likely they will be if you're holding your ground as a Muslim, okay, you have to bow down respectfully. Do not fall into that pit of shaitaniyat, that, uh, that, 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 that anger uh, taps into. No, do not fall into that at all. Always with respect, always with calm, always with uh, elocution, and you should be fine. Sensum, thank you. Um, another question here. Um, you know, what is the extent to which we need to follow the maraji uh, in the absence of the imam? And what does our imam expect from us in terms of uh, taqlid? Well, uh, you know, taqlid is an intellectual conclusion that comes from uh, considering the question of the responsibilities of the believer. Um, and on an intellectual level, taklid is extremely important because taklid really says, if you're not an expert in something, refer to an expert. That's all it says, all right? You know, if I am not a lawyer, but I'm well-versed in law, and I can call myself an expert in law, I don't need a lawyer to defend me in court. You know, for example, moon sighting, you know, all of the uh, Maraje would tell you the exception to their fatwa about moon sighting is if you verify the moon sighting yourself. If you verify the moon sighting yourself, you saw the moon, right? You know, so you can go against your marriage if he says the moon is tomorrow and you think, the, no, the moon should be today, right? You could start your, 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 your fasting today, all right? Um, but... To say that I'm not going to follow a marja because, you know, they're all this and they're all that, and you're not a knowledgeable person, is something irrational, is something dangerous too, because you're actually going against your common sense, and you could be, uh, go to hell for that, you know, because you go to hell and God says, why don't you do this this right way? Why don't you pay the homes to, 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 this, to this one and that one? You know, you said, we said well, you know, because... Uh, you know, I don't like these maraje and they might just take my money and give it to their family or something like that. You know, you'd be asking for trouble, you see. Um, so, uh, takli is a very important part of our fiqh. You know, we have to stay, uh, be, uh, be, uh, adhere to it. It prevents deviation. You know, in the Sunni school of thought, for example, you have all kinds of deviation within the Sunni, Sunni school of thought. Take, for example, the Wahhabi, the Wahhabi uh, school of thought that is spreading itself all over the world right now, you know. Um, but having maraje and maraje that are pious that we like we like we do have, you know, and um, who are zahid, you know, who are ascetic and so forth, you know, who have come, you know, devoted their their, their lives to to learning, you know. I think yes, I think we do need to follow to follow the maraje. I think also um, we need to probably try to, uh, if if we are the, if we reserve it, um, reach a point where we have our own maraje. You see, where we have our own maraje, so where we can impose uh, things like, for example, transparency in terms of funds. Okay, because there are some problems with these types of things. Transparency in terms of funds, how they are expended, and so forth and so on. I personally don't. Think that it should be a situation where you have to pay your homes and so forth outside of your country. You know, yes, you should if there, there are no alternatives, you know, but I do think that we should try to encourage alternatives. That means you try to send the children to Koma and so forth and Najaf and so forth and so on to study. But when they fit, when they study, come back here, come back here, you know, and be our maraje. You know, you don't have to be the most knowledgeable in all the world. Let's be the most knowledgeable for us here in, in the UK, you know, so we could give them their homes and they could administer it right here because they know exactly what our conditions are here and so on.
Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Sheikh. I'll just end uh, with one final question, inshallah. Um, inshallah, for the benefit uh, of those that are watching, um, it's kind of split into two mini parts. Um, number one, what are some uh, supplications or du'as you would recommend uh, that we can recite either on a daily or weekly basis uh, in order to build the connection with the 12th Imam, not just by sitting there reading the Arabic, but actually by reading the English and pondering over the words, learning more about our duties uh, towards the 12th Imam, about the beauty of the 12th Imam and his characteristics. And, and number two, if you can recommend any further reading uh, with regards to learning more about kind of uh, the occultation, uh, the characteristics and features of the Imam, the signs of the reappearance, what the Imam's government will look like. Um, obviously we have a lot now available online uh, on adislam.org and we're still currently in some form of lockdown and might be in this state for some time so i think it's the onus is on us very much to try and build our knowledge uh, and to use these resources and to learn about the imam so the first part was du'as and then the second part any books or uh, other works uh, about uh, imam zamana well, uh, you're muted sheikh sorry thank you yeah, du'a, du'a faraj is a very important du'a you know um also, um, I think, you know, to be able to establish links with the Imam, you know, is to, for example, you know, send uh, salats to, for him, you know, do salawat for him, things like that. Um, uh, you know, give him charity um, in his name. You know, these are things that draw us close to the Imam and so on. Um, with respect to books, yeah, I mean, I think you, you, you hit the nail right on the head. You answered my question. You know, you can find so many things online. There are so many books, uh, for example, uh, Kitab al Ghaiba, for example, has been translated into, into, uh, into English. Uh, you can get that online. You know, um, there's so much material that we can get. You know, there's a very interesting website called PDF Drive. I think you should try it, check that out. You can find a lot of Shia material there as well. Um, uh, Alislam.org is becoming even more and more organized and having more and more material on it that, I, that um, I find very interesting, you know, and very um, constructive and useful. You can use that as well. Asanta. Uh, once again, um, I think we'll, uh, we'll end there. I think, alhamdulillah, we had a really, really fruitful, beneficial discussion, not just the lecture, but alhamdulillah, we, all, we were able to bring in the uh, interactive dynamic uh, thank you very, very much, uh, Sheikh Ahmed Hani, for giving up your time, uh, for joining us on this. Actually, it's also a, a Friday as well. Um, so it's even more uh, beautiful to be able to discuss and to learn more and to build more of a relationship with, uh, with the 12th Imam uh, on this particular day. Thank you very, very much. Um, I personally benefited and I'm sure everyone benefited. In fact, it's such a huge topic and we covered so much. I'm sure we could have like a whole series of lectures or sessions on this. So inshallah, perhaps in the future, we can come back to this. Um, and just again, just to remind everyone uh, that al Mundazir Network uh, is uh, a network um, that seeks to align and to hold uh, events and sessions that seek to align our lives with the expectations uh, of the Imam of our time. And today, Alhamdulillah, went very, very uh, much uh, towards doing that. Uh, thank you to everyone, uh, especially throughout the, Ram uh, the month of Ramadan, for all of your support, uh, for your participation in the programs that have been held, for your contributions as well towards Al Muntazir Network and for making Al Muntazir Network just in about five or six months, al Alhamdulillah, an organization that's slowly becoming even more active and uh, even more well known. We ask that you keep the organization, uh, all of the volunteers, all of the speakers uh, in your du'as, inshallah. And for those of you that maybe missed the beginning, again, just to reiterate, uh, a new initiative that has been launched by Al Muntazir Network uh, is the uh, Manqabat Academy. So, the opportunity for you and your children, if you're interested in recitation uh, of Manqabat, of Salams, of Nahas, uh, in honor of the Ahlul Bayt, and this is an opportunity for you to take part in uh, online sessions via Zoom. Um, with uh, well-known reciters, uh, including Sayyid Muzam al-Rizwi, Sayyid Misam Ali Mehdi and myself. Um, and again, the cycle is a three-month cycle. Um, so over tw about 12 to 15 weeks, uh, one hour session per week on Sundays at 4.30 p.m. 
um, and inshallah this will uh, give uh, participants the required training to to be able to allow them to confidently recite in their Islamic centers uh, in their own homes uh, on YouTube Facebook etc as well and the message will be shared inshallah uh, uh, in due course um, regarding um, how to get in touch it's very easy just send uh, send an email to the stated email address by the 10th of June and uh, you will receive a response uh, with further details, kind of the, the, the schedule for your classes, who your teacher is, login details and things like that. So please, please do take advantage, uh, especially parents, um, if you want to inculcate this love of Azadari and Imam Hussein uh, in your children, please, please take advantage of this wonderful opportunity. It's all online. We're all at home. We have the time now. Uh, let's take advantage of, of, of what we have. Um, and once again, um, a thank you to Sheikh Zahir Jafri, who joined us throughout the month of Ramadan every day for uh, the recitation of the Holy Quran and also for the A'mars. Uh, on the nights of Qadr, we pray that Allah gives him the tawfiq to continue to uh, serve the Ahlul Bayt in this way and also protects him and his family and gives them health and prosperity and happiness as well. Um, if we could please uh, recite once again a Surah Al Fatiha for Sayyid Ali Raza Zaidi, Sayyid Abbas Hasnain Zaidi, Sayyid Ihsan Ahmad, uh, Sayyid Shahid Ali Zaidi, uh, and all other Shahada and Marhumin, also Sister. Um, Aya Hashim, our dear sister who uh, recently was shot and just a few days ago uh, she was buried uh, in Lebanon. Um, please recite a Surah Al-Fatiha for all of these, these beautiful souls, please. Al-Fatiha. Um, if we could please recite also five times Dua uh, Shifa uh, for all of those that may be unwell, uh, both uh, in the UK and around the world, suffering with coronavirus, uh, other issues and other forms of suffering. Five times, please. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Amma yujibu al-mudatarra ida da'a hu yakshif busu'a. Amma yujibu al-mudatarra ida da'a hu yakshif busu'a. أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعاء هو يكشف السوء أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعاء هو يكشف السوء أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعاء هو يكشف السوء اللهم صل على Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad wa Ajil Farajum. And we'll end uh, very fittingly uh, with the recitation of Dua Faraj, inshallah, for the reappearance and for the protection of uh, the, the Imam of our time. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Allahumma kulli walika al hujjat ibn al Hassan. Salawatuka alayhi wa ala abai. Fi hadihi sa'ati wa fi kulli sa'a. Waliya wa hafidha wa qaida wa nasira. ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه أرضك طوعا وتمتعه فيها طويلا برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين وصل اللهم على سيدنا ونبينا محمد وآله الطاهرين Thank you again, everyone, for joining us. Thank you, Sheikh Ahmed Hanif, for your time and for your words of wisdom. Everyone, please take care and stay safe. Keep updated on Facebook and our WhatsApp group uh, with regards to upcoming programs and initiatives, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali